Be the Talk, Episode 60, featuring Nick Macaron. Welcome to Be the Talk. We go behind the talk seven days a week for tips and techniques to help you change the world. I'm Nathan Eckel, and a talker myself, I'm interviewing others who change the world with their talk. You can too, even if you've never given a talk before. Let's get started with today's show. We are live with Nick Macaron. Nick, are you ready to talk? I am ready. Nick Macaron is an actor, writer, and teacher. He has appeared on Scandal, Law & Order SVU, Elementary, and Unforgettable. Since releasing his book to the prospective artist, Lessons from an Unknown Actor, Nick has been invited to speak at universities, conferences, and workshops all across the country. Nick's message revolves around the six principles that empower artists and actors to live a life and not just a career. Nick Macaron, welcome to the talk. Thank you for having me, Nathan. Very grateful to you. So I love your talk. It's called Six Ways Actors and Artists Can Empower Themselves. And as a former classically trained musician who uh, was in very much the same shoes as uh, a lot of actor friends of mine, I found that it was great advice that I wish I had a a 30-year-old time machine that I could have taken your advice. Your, your talk is called, again, Six Ways Actors and Artists Can Empower Themselves. Uh, please take us behind the talk, Nick. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, like being a musician, the acting industry or being a professional actor is, you know, very, very nuanced and it's complex and it's very challenging. And I think what happens is there's a lot of actors that come out of grad school programs or BFA programs and they're ready to take on the world. They're, t- they're ready to take Broadway by storm. And, you know, they dream of uh, gracing the Broadhurst Theater and the Schubert Theaters. And you realize after you come out of a drama program that actually the actual acting part is a very small component of it. You have to sort of very quickly inform yourself about the professional aspect of it, the business side of it. And for a lot of artists, that's really disenchanting. It's a very, very unfamiliar world. And as a, as a result, people who love music like you and people who love performing, people who love singing, they get sort of bogged down by the need to self-promote that they end up sort of losing that love for it. And so as a result, what I saw, at least in my circle of friends and my personal experience was I saw a lot of actors feel really disempowered because they weren't getting that phone call for that part. Or they weren't auditioning as much as their colleagues and their friends. They weren't booking that TV show. Um, I always joke that every actor probably can relate to the story of being on their MacBook Pro or their computer at 2 o'clock in the morning, scrolling another actor's IMDb page and and, uh, comparing where they should be at a certain age. And, you know, what I discovered was that there are actually lots of ways that you can empower yourself rather than being at the mercy of an industry, an agent, and uh, essentially allowing yourself to define success on your own terms and find ways to get your voice heard. I mean, there's so many different, as you know, uh, Nathan, there's so many different platforms now to get your voice heard. You've got a terrific podcast, for example. You can set up a blog, uh, and they're very, very user-friendly, and most of the time they're free. So they're really, if you ask me, there's really not a lot of excuse for, for waiting anymore and not taking initiative. You and I can make a movie right now on a smartphone. So my message really is about emboldening actors and artists to step up and go out and amplify their voice in any way that they can to define success on their own terms but also to live a life and not just a career. I was that actor that got to the theater at five o'clock in the morning. I was that actor that had to be the first to get there, the last to leave. You know, I reaped many rewards from doing that and uh, improved my craftsmanship as an actor and an artist on stage. But I was sort of spiritually, I would say, bankrupt. And it wasn't until I was going through a lot of personal struggles after graduating that I realized there was more to life than a headshot or, or impressing a casting director. And Uh, What's really funny, Nathan, is after I infused my life with other meaningful things, uh, things that should have been the stars all along and not supporting actors, if you will, like family and friends and traveling and volunteering, I actually became a much much better actor, uh, if that makes any sense. Well, it certainly does because you've empowered yourself and you've leveraged yourself because you've become a value adder and you've become a more interesting person. You've become a more confident person and a better person frankly, a better negotiator. And that's what happens to all of us when we take permission and we step up and we become positive instead of waiting for life to happen. I just wish I could 
connected with you and uh, heard this message 30 years ago when I was preparing to go and run through a musical version of the same gauntlet that, that you ran through. So uh, uh, I'll let you respond to that, but I, I hope that we'll, we'll be able to go into uh, at least one or two of those specific ways that you mentioned in your talk. And uh, I'm going to give away for Talk Universe to be able to find that talk if they can't already. They're not already typing it into YouTube right now. What are your thoughts on, on what we're talking about and being able to leverage and, uh, and, and just be wise and smart in the way that you approach life, whatever your dream is? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I just want to say that you're obviously doing very well. Uh, I mean, you, it sounds like you put down an instrument to, to pick up a microphone, which, you know, and you're, you're influencing the world through your own art form, by the way, and through a new craft. And uh, so, and we find out the things we find out when, when we do. And so I think your journey is, uh, is unique and, and just as important as anyone else's. So I'm, I'm glad that you're here and, and offering the, the value that you are. What I would say is, to, to answer the, the question you just asked, it's a wonderful question. I would encourage, when I speak to actors, particularly young actors, one of the things that I encourage them to do is to be disciplined in their approach to whatever their goals are, but to be flexible in the methods. So don't be so, don't have such stringent tunnel vision that you're not open to other possibilities. Uh, I think, you know, people can relate to the idea of, stumbling across a job opportunity that maybe they didn't dream of as a kid, but came out of another opportunity because they were open to it. So I think being flexible in thought is absolutely imperative. You know, when I was getting out of drama school, my idea of success and my idea of what it looked like to be an actor was so linear that I actually closed myself off to a lot of opportunities. And I actually ended up closing myself off to a lot of people that cared about me deeply and it wasn't until I was a little bit more flexible, more pliant in my thinking and my approach that other things came to me because I was open to it. So if you can, you know, if you can just think of yourself and think of life as um, this ever evolving and changing thing, because as you get older, the things that you value in life change. So if you're still holding on to sort of an old model, an old, an old template that's obsolete, then you're going after things that you don't really care about anymore. So it's really important to be flexible in the way that you approach your life, your craft, and I think that it's really important to, to give yourself a little space to change your mind. I mean, I think it's really, there's such a stigma now of saying, I don't know, and I change my mind, and, and, and being afraid to fail. I think those are three incredibly important things. Unfortunately, there's a stigma for people failing. Failing is the only way you learn. As an actor, and you're, you're a musician, Nathan, so I know you can, uh, you can relate to this, 99% um, of being an actor is being told no. So in essence, you have to learn to not take the most personal thing personally. <laughs> so it's a very, it's a very delicate yeah. two-step. But in that, in that, yeah, you can relate to that, right? I'm sure. Of course. Can, can you relate to that as a musician? Of yeah. course. Well, at least I'm not a singer. <laughs> at least they're not actually enjoying, they're rejecting my instrument instead of my actual voice. So <laughs> that I've heard it's always even worse for singers and possibly actors and as well. <laughs> Right. But, you know, you as a musician, this is a thing, right, Nathan, is you might not consider yourself uh, a successful musician, but you might be wildly successful to another musician who's up and coming. So, again, I would say to be flexible in the parameters that we put around success. There's lots of people that you can inspire that you could shorten the learning curve of. And I'm sure there are plenty of people in the world who, who think you're, uh, you know, deeply skilled at, at your craft. So, again, I think it's really important, you know, to some people acting in a black box theater in the East Village in front of 12 people is not success. But for me, for a time, it was. And so I think it's really important to not abide by some conventional norm of success because people tell you that's what it is. Uh, I was actually thinking about this last night when I knew because I knew you and I were going to speak. But if, if you ever listen to interviews of people that are quote unquote successful, like interviews at the Stanford Graduate School or on any talk show, I, invariably, they're, they're people who are wealthy, right, or have a lot of money. And you know, I think that that's great, but I also think that it can do a lot of damage because I think that if we're going to interview people who are financially wealthy, we should also be interviewing people who are spiritually and emotionally uh, and men mentally wealthy as well to, to see what, how they got there as well. Because not everybody has got the same parameters of the goalpost for what they deem as success. You could, you could be a billionaire, but be miserable, and you could kind of just be making ends meet, but you could have a remarkable family and be really happy. So, I think that it's really important to define success and happiness and 
on our own terms. And those are things that took me a long time to figure out. And I'm still figuring those things out, but um, they've made me a much happier person and, and subsequently um, a happier artist. Talk universe. I hope you hear what Nick's saying because success really is relative and success. The other thing that I hear him saying is that success can absolutely be reframed and the more flexible you are and the more creative you are, you can take something that maybe your uh, one month or, or one year ago self would say and look at and judge it as a failure. But if you're creative and flexible, you can reframe that and find the aspects of growth and grit and worthiness to make that a success. And that has a huge impact on the way that we judge ourselves or reward ourselves and just esteem ourselves. Any thoughts on that, Nick? Yeah, I think that's a wonderful point. I think that's exactly right. And so how do we do that, right? That's the question, I guess. And how do we get, how do we gain that perspective? Well, as you and I have been talking about, I think the first step is to be open to it. I think the second step is what I have found. And uh, one thing I'm really pushing for in my writing and my speaking is one of the best ways to, I guess, gain perspective on your troubles or your problems is to try to mitigate those of other people. And so I got so tired, Nathan, of hearing my own voice and hearing myself complain about not getting this part or that part that I wanted to go hear somebody else's problems. <laughs> that's, that's great. I just got to say, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> So I started, uh, I hopped on a train, I'd hop on a train every, every Monday morning and, uh, I would jump on the F train and I would come go from Manhattan to Jamaica, Queens. And I'd go to this high school and I would sit there and I would listen to these, uh, mostly, uh, African-American young men, um, who were talking about, you know, the struggles of being, uh, it, it, part of that community of, of being young of wanting to go to college. These were remarkable men. Uh, and they taught me far more than I probably imparted on them. And I learned so much just by listening to them and what they wanted and the dreams that they hoped to accomplish that that springboarded me and then, uh, to go to a men's shelter every Thursday night. I would set up beds for about half an hour. And then I would help women at the Coalition for the Homeless down at Wall Street put together resumes. These are incredible people. And what I what I learned is that it's when you see people who are not at a certain um, sort of socioeconomic level, it almost has nothing to do with intellect or talent. It has everything to do with opportunity. And that really broadened my perspective. And so I, I started going to different parts of the world. I ended up going to Haiti, which is, I believe, the second poorest country or the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, I went to South Africa, to a small village in South Africa. And then I ended up going um, to Nepal to volunteer. Now, look, I, I know that people, there's a lot of mixed feelings uh, about the ethics behind what they call volunteerism, if you're actually doing more harm than good. And look, I, I'll be the first to admit that I wasn't changing the world, but I like to think that I was influencing a small community in some small way, whether it was helping to build a small house in Haiti or helping kids with their homework in Nepal or helping kids in South Africa with, uh, you know, computer literacy. And it just gave me this perspective when I came back from these countries, when I'd come back from that school in Jamaica, Queens, when I'd come back from that men's shelter, I mean, you can imagine how much I was worrying about a headshot. <laughs> you can imagine how much I was worrying about not getting those four lines on law and order. You know, sometimes we become so bogged down with what it is we do and we get puffed up with self-importance that we forget there's an entire world around us where life is happening. It's happening. It's happening. And people are going through, not to uh, mitigate or, or downplay anybody else's problems, but I think when you come across other people who are just trying to get through the day, it, it really puts your problems in perspective. And I think that you can, uh, you can approach the work in a different way. As, as a Clint Eastwood quote, that there's two quotes that I love by two actors, Clint Eastwood and, and, uh, and Robert De Niro, and, uh, that I try to live by. And Clint Eastwood says, take the work seriously, but not yourself. And Robert De Niro says, be brave, but not reckless. And I love both of those. And I think, you know, I, I think about those two things every day and I, I try to approach my life from, from that vantage point. So like we said, talk universe success is relative. And what I love about what Nick is talking about is, uh, he's looking at the success continuum and he's not just looking up, but he's looking 
in the direction opposite of up and he's, he's finding other people that don't yet have the opportunities and are struggling to get where they're going. And he's been a part, he's empowered them, he's given them opportunities. And in the process, uh, that's one of the best things that, that we can do to uh, defeat depression and uh, be able to reframe and have a healthier set of emotions. Uh, I, I've seen that said over and over and over again. So when Nick is talking about doing that in his spare time, it's one of the most empowering things. Uh, almost even, he's not doing it for selfish reasons, but it does benefit us when we find ways to serve. And whether that's Rotary or your local homeless shelter or anything else, can't uh, say highly enough uh, recommending doing that. So. Uh, that all said, uh, it is about time for the Blitz round. So, Nick, are you ready? Let's do it. All right. So, Nick, uh, were you selected or applied to speak? I was like an actor, Nathan. I basically cold called all these different <laughs> TEDx venues from across the country. Why did I even ask? <laughs> A true actor. <laughs> well, you know, that, and I'll tell you what, that's the greatest gift acting has given me is I have absolutely zero fear of failure. Zero. And so I cold called uh, 60 to 65 TEDx's or cold called by messaging them on mm -hmm. Facebook. And, you know, a handful got back. And, uh, and, and luckily, um, the one uh, that I ended up speaking at uh, was, was kind enough to have me. Are you a memorizer, an improviser, or a blender? That's a great question. Well, as an actor, you know, obviously I've spent the last 13 years of my life memorizing text. So uh, I memorize the text, but I will say, just kind of like jazz, that in order to improvise, you've got to have that composition down. Mm. So I think that if you memor for me, memorizing is really important. But if I see, if I forget something on stage, if I forget a line, then I have that flexibility to, to improvise if I have to. Now, Talk Universe knows the answer to this. Seasoned performer or new to the stage? We already know the answer to that. So that said, did you have nerves or were you in the zone or neither or both? You know, I don't know if any actor, you know, Henry Fonda would throw up for, um, <laughs> before getting on Broadway and we, yeah. until he was 75 years old. You know, I still got some of the, some of the butterflies before I got on stage for sure. And then, but I think the advantage for me is that, um, it, it doesn't take very long to settle in. Uh, one thing that I do want to say really quickly that I think will be helpful for anyone who's petrified of public speaking or, or giving an audition or whatever it is. I also spent five years as a Broadway casting reader, and oh. this is something that fundamentally changed the way that I looked at auditioning or public speaking. A lot of times when we get up in front of people, we're scared because we think the people in the audience are judging us. So let me ask you, Nathan, when was the last time you went to go see a show and you said, I hope everybody performing tonight is awful and wastes my time? Yeah, never, never. We always, we always want you to succeed. Right. So why do we think differently about the people in our <laughs> audience? So just think that the people in the audience, they're on your side. They want you to be awesome. They're your allies. So if you can think of them in those terms, uh, I know that's helped me a lot. So for anyone who's about ready to give a public speech or, or something, please keep that in mind. And of course, remember to breathe. We forget to breathe all the time. I know it sounds <laughs> silly, but, uh, but breathe. So Nick just answered the next question, which is a technique or a tool that helped you. I think he gave us at least two or three right in there. Visualize success. Realize we want you to succeed and breathe. What was the, uh, because this is live performance, Nick, last question, what was the unexpected, strange, or just plain weird thing that happened during your talk or right before? Oh, that's so funny. The woman uh, who spoke before me, she gave a wonderful talk, but she was talking about genocide. So she was talking about something that was very important topic, but uh, it was a difficult topic. And so following that up, you always end in theater. They say you always end on a comedy. And mine wasn't comedic, but trying to get the audience's energy in a different direction, I think, was sort of my, my obstacle or my challenge. Uh, after they had, they had sat through a TED Talk that was very, very well done, but very heavy. And then having to go on stage after that was, was a little bit tricky. But I, I think it took a couple minutes in, uh, they settled into that one as well. Well, congratulations on shifting the energy without the use of an MC or other, uh, a break or other device. <laughs> <laughs> Not easy to do. Wow. Well, hey, in a moment, we're coming right back to Nick for the final word of advice. Before we do that, I want to urge you to go to our show notes page at be the talk.com. You're going to be able to see 
a link that you can click. If you haven't already typed it into YouTube, Nick's talk, Six Ways Actors and Artists Can Empower Themselves. We've got a link in there. And we also have a link where you can connect with Nick at nickmacaron.com. Nick, M-A-C-C-A-R-O-N-E, nickmacaron.com. Back to you, Nick, for the final word of advice. Sure. I would just say for anyone who's thinking of giving a TED Talk uh, or th- thinking of giving a speech, make it about your audience. Don't make it about you. So it's not an opportunity for you to just kind of showcase your talents or your ability as a speaker or to brag about your experiences. Ask yourself one thing that the audience can walk away from your speech and apply to their lives. If you keep coming back to that, what can I do for someone else? And you keep coming back to that question in the audience, uh, I think you're going to have a terrific time on stage and and uh, and offer a ton of value to people who are eager to listen to what you have to say. Nick Macaron, thanks so much for coming to be the talk and sharing your wisdom with Talk Universe today. Oh, Nathan, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you so much, and I, uh, I love the work you're doing. It's very important. Thanks for listening to Be The Talk. For tips and resources to help you change the world, go to bethetalk.com. See you tomorrow.